thank you uh, for the introduction and uh, thank you for having me come speak with you today. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, speak for a couple of minutes uh, on what I do and what our group does at Sylvester, uh, give you an idea of some of the exciting research that's going on down there. Uh, I'm in Deerfield Beach and, at Univers and, and down in Miami both. Um, and then certainly take an opportunity at the end to answer questions and, and clarify anything that wasn't clear. Uh, I'm part of the division of, of hematologic oncology, so we deal with blood cancers. And, typic and, and what I mean by that is we deal with white blood cell cancers. When white blood cells become malignant, uh, you can have what's called a leukemia, where the white cells float in the bloodstream. You can have a lymphoma, where the white cells grow in the lymph nodes. Or you can have other related diseases, and what you just heard, the term plasma cell diseases, these are cancers of the types of white blood cells that make antibody proteins. The most well-known is multiple myeloma. All of these diseases have features in common, have treatments in common, but also have uh, their own unique characteristics, and I'll speak to you a little bit about them as a group, and then a little bit more specifically in terms of the plasma cell diseases. You're probably aware, many of you are, are, are probably aware about how, how, how quick things are moving in the field of cancer research. Um, there was an HBO special around a week or two ago on blood cancers. Uh, and it, it's almost every week in the lay press you'll see some exciting developments, many of them focused on targeted therapies, uh, immunologic therapies, vaccine-based therapies, and some other terms that sound really cool and are really cool. And to put it in context, 20, 30, 40 years ago, uh, and still some, somewhat today, the way we treated cancer was by giving medicines that killed cells that were trying to divide. Cancer cells divide a lot, that's the problem. They grow, they spread. So when you give strong chemotherapy drugs that kill dividing cells, they kill the cancer cells, but they also kill a lot of our own dividing cells that we need. Hair follicles, which is why people will lose their hair. Intestinal cells, which is why people can be nauseated. And those medicines work, but those medicines are toxic. And the modern era of oncology is really about targeting medicines to cancers. And this can be uh, by directly targeting what makes the cancer cell different than the normal cell. This could be by training the immune system to learn to detect and fight against cancer. And it could be combinations therein. Uh, over the last 10 years, the pace of discovery has been very rapid. Uh, but I would say that we're still probably on the doorstep of some really fundamental changes. And hopefully a lot of cancers that up to this point are not deemed curable, we hope that that's going to change. The most exciting, or one of the most exciting areas of research within, within my arena is immunologic therapies. And again, some of you may have heard because the exciting stories uh, make it to, the, make it to you know, Yahoo News and, and make it to uh, uh, NBC, et cetera. Um, there was a story out of Mayo Clinic uh, a, f a few months ago at this point where they trained measles virus, you may have heard this, to fight against the disease that I specialize in, multiple myeloma. And it was a small group of people that benefited. It was one woman in particular that her disease is totally undetectable despite failing all known therapies. Um, and, and I'm not sure that a year or two from now we're going to be giving high-dose re-engineered measles to people with blood cancers, but it's, a, it's a, a testament to some of the exciting new approaches that are being explored. Uh, you know, around 40 or 50 years ago, uh, pediatric leukemias were, were incurable. And there's a book called The Emperor of All Maladies which describes uh, the history of cancer research, and they talk about little kids uh, around, I think at this point, I guess 50 or 60 years ago at this point, when little kids got ALL, acute lymphoblastic lymphoma, the most common cancer in little kids, it was always fatal, 100% fatal. And the first time they used chemotherapy on these kids, it was, like, it was like a miracle. The kids would come in sick, and then they would go home, re-enroll in school, and it would last for a short time, and then they would all relapse, and they would still all pass away. And then they decided to combine a lot of the medicines that were available at the time, which was thought to be very radical. These medicines are poisons in reality if given in, in, in certain doses. And nowadays, as a result of that effort, 90% of kids with that illness are, are cured. Uh, those successes have not been repeated in every area of, of cancer research, but they're, they're repeated more and more. In the world of blood cancers, since that the, the origins of combination chemotherapy curing those kids, 
there's been many monumental steps. I'll give you one example. There's a blood cancer called CML, chronic myeloid leukemia, which some of you may have heard of. CML was the most common indication for a stem cell transplant 20, 30 years ago. If you went to a stem cell transplant ward, they'd be filled with these patients. And something changed really in the late 1990s. And in fact, I know this personally because I was, had recently been married and my wife was uh, identified to be a stem cell donor. And right before she was supposed to donate, she got a phone call that they were going to try this new medicine first, and if it didn't work, they were going to call her back. And she never got called back. And we didn't know it at the time, but there was a medicine that became approved shortly thereafter that some of you may have heard of called Gleevec. Gleevec is a medicine that's a pill, take it once a day, and it takes around 80 to 90% of patients with CML. They take their pills once a day, it never progresses, they look great, they feel great, they never need a stem cell transplant. In fact, in my practice now, I don't see a ton of CML, but I see some, and the biggest challenge is to convince people to take their pills. That's how, that's how benign of a condition people start to think about it. And what's really kind of cool about that story, or, or a sign about how cool that story was, is the medicine was so exciting. These were patients that were first tested on this pill that had no hope. I mean, this was a last ditch effort. And they took this once daily pill, had no side effects, and their counts became normal, and they went into remission. It was, a, it was truly a miracle. And um, the company uh, was, was forced to race the drug to approval so fast because it was such a miraculous drug that they literally did not have the time to trademark a name for, for the drug. And they had a drug that they had tried prior that failed, that was supposed to be a glioblastoma vaccine, a vaccine drug for brain tumors. They owned the name to that drug, so they just took the name of that drug, slapped it on this drug, and sent it to market calling it Gleevec. And so some people are confused about why this drug for blood cancer is called Gleevec, like glioblastoma vaccine. Uh, and it's just a sign of how amazing that drug was. And I think in the world of blood cancers, we've been chasing the Gleevec story ever since, and there's been some successes like it. But a lot of us view that as kind of the moment that we realize that targeted medicines uh, were, the, were the wave of the future. Doing uh, uh, genomic sequencing, figuring out the genes uh, of these cancers to a very fine level, and again, one of the biggest problems of cancer, these are cells that come from us. They're a lot like us. Right? How do you find a medicine to kill something that's a lot like us and only a little bit different? But by analyzing the cancer cells in a very detailed way using modern gene analysis, we can find these things and we can target them. And so again, where we're at today, we still use some of the same medicines that we did 10, 20, 30 years ago, but we use them in fewer and fewer cases. We're finding ways to target cancers, find out what makes them individual. We're finding ways to train the immune system to, to fight against cancer. And I think this is, uh, this is going to be viewed 20 or 30 years from now as the doorstep into a modern era of cancer treatments. And people won't remember a lot of what we now think about in terms of the 60s, 70s, and 80s in terms of cancer care. So to take this and make this a little, a little bit more specific to Sylvester, I worked with um, Dr. Neymar at Sloan Kettering. That's how I knew him. And when he came to take over Sylvester, that's ultimately why, why I came. And he recruited me. And I think he's done a really great job recruiting uh, uh, scientists that are doing a lot of exciting things. And for me, uh, that's, a, that's a wonderful part of my job. When I get to partner with people that are working on mouse models of cancer and different um, uh, novel uh, therapies, and, and I get to work with them designing clinical trials to use those medicines. Uh, at Sylvester, uh, the leukemia program is, I think, already one of the best in the country. The stem cell transplant program is one of the fastest growing in the country. Uh, the lymphoma program, headed by Dr. Losos, has national renown as well. And I came to focus on these plasma cell diseases like multiple myeloma, the third most common blood cancer. And in my two years at Sylvester, we've grown a pretty large clinical study repertoire where patients in South Florida that have diseases like multiple myeloma um, can come, stay local, and get cutting edge therapies when, when they need it. Uh, and have a state-of-the-art pathology group and radiology group and surgical group behind it. And I grew up in South Florida. I did all my training in New York. But uh, for me, it's really nice to see uh, that South Florida has a up-and-coming academic uh, cancer center, uh, which we all know is desperately needed. And I guess the final thing I would mention is uh, cancer research is expensive. And uh, as many of you also may know from the lay press, um, 
Funding is, is challenging. Certainly governmental funding has been cut back. And more and more cancer centers like Sylvester rely on uh, philanthropy. And the PAP Corps does a wonderful job supporting Sylvester. And all of us uh, are aware of it and very appreciative. So I, th I certainly thank all of you personally, because a lot of the research we do wouldn't be possible without uh, philanthropic giving. Uh, and again, I, I think that the fruits of this giving uh, are being seen at a pace which has really never been seen before. Uh, you know, again, in my world, uh, next to my bed is just a stack of journals. It's almost, it's almost impossible to keep up, even when you're focused on one small area uh, because of the rapid pace of, of improvement. And we're all, human beings are all going to benefit from that because, again, everyone in this room in probably some form or another has been touched with cancer and their family. And uh, every uh, advance has real tangible benefits to, to us in this room and to people that we love outside of this room.